Welcome to uh, Witnessing Palestine on Mondowice. Uh, this is um, episode two of the show. When, when we recorded the first show with uh, Nura Erekat um, <clears throat> about, about two weeks ago now, I, I had really hoped that for the second show, um, like this one, I could start, you know, we could start with me talking about the day after, you know, a permanent ceasefire is in place. How do we rebuild like human life in a way in Gaza? But 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 I guess I was wrong. Um, the genocide, because that is what is happening in Palestine right now. Some people have called it the most documented genocide in history. Uh, the indiscriminate killing of Palestinians is still ongoing. To discuss this, I'm joined today by two uh, truly amazing guests um, that have uh, helped me and many others uh, shape the way we think and we understand uh, Palestine. So it's it's really an honor and a privilege for me to have both Susan Abulawa and uh, Francesca Albanese, Albanese with, with me today. Um, and what I would like to discuss with you both today, and we, we've we've talked about it before starting the recording, is in a way the meaning of Palestine also, because you know the, the meaning of what's happening right now for human civilization and for the future of democracy in a way is is crucial, because for me I think Palestine has become a symbol of everything that is wrong with the world, but it's also become a symbol through its people, through its artists, through its journalists, through its medics, through its children, through its teachers of sumud and resistance, and it's become a symbol of, um, in a way, an old world led by rich, warmongers, old white men, slowly crum crumbling, and a new world that we still have to build, but that is based on solidarity, love, and compassion. And I think this is the moment. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, tr I'm, you know, it sounds utopian or something, um, but maybe, I would like to, to start with you, Susan, by asking you um, if what we are seeing now in Gaza is in fact, unfortunately, something that Zionism was always going to lead to. Um, yeah, and you know what you're feeling is something we're all feeling. I don't, I don't think it's utopian. I don't think we should think of it as that. I think it's, it's wholly attainable. Um, in in many ways, Israel is is the linchpin. It's the it's sort of the last stand for colonialism and imperialism in that world that you're talking about, um, and and which is and that's the reason why they're they're fighting tooth and nail. That's the reason why you know you have these uh, these world superpowers all converging on a principally defenseless civilian society uh, because there is a real, there is a real uh, uh, promise for me and danger for them that, that Israel could, uh, could be defeated and they, ha and, and left alone really without the United States, they, this would have been over a long time ago because, uh, because this small uh, uh, indigenous resistance force that is, uh, you know, lightly armed, uh, has has been pummeling, uh, you know, this this massive military that was planted in the middle of the Arab world in Western Asia and North Africa, and I think so. So that's on the on one hand. On the other hand, there is this groundswell of humanity. Uh, that that identifies uh, that has you know humanity that has lived under the yoke of this this rapacious capitalist consuming polluting destroying system that we've all been forced to participate in just by virtue of living where we live and um, and so yeah it is it is it's a it's a global struggle it's not just this local conflict um and it and the outcome of this will determine the fate of humanity and that is not an exaggeration to say that it will if if israel is allowed to prevail with its aims 
of uh, uh, first of all, you know, d- displacing uh, Palestinians and conquering Gaza and establishing, you know, settlements again, that will cement this world order that allows, that is basically, it is the law of the rich, period. What the wealthy, what the powerful want is what will go, and we are all slaves to it. On the other hand, if <clears throat> Gaza prevails, and of course, you know, there's, I mean, th- th- the loss is enormous, but and but triumph for us is simply holding on to our land uh, and achieving basic universal dignity. I mean, that is what that is what triumph for us means. It is not conquest. It is not uh, 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 killing or destruction of the other. It is simply a world in which people are not the value of people is not based on their religion or the color of their skin or, or what they have in their bank account, but rather it is simply uh, uh, the value of any human being by virtue of living. And, and so, you know, that's, that is not a utopia. That is something that we all want. It is some, it, it is, I mean, nobody, you know, nobody would disagree with that except for, the people who stand to gain a lot by conquest, and uh, and they are the Zionists, they are the the white supremacists, they are the billionaires who who extract and exploit our labor and uh, and rob us at every turn, uh, and and instigate coups and wars and and genocides all over the world. So, yeah. Francesca, do you, do you want to um, respond to this or um, yeah? Uh-huh. Maybe just to add on to this, I I, I agree, and the, the the picture is really grim, both for today and tomorrow. It will take a long time to recover from from this blow to the Palestinians first and foremost, because it's unfathomable what has been uh, what has befallen them once again. At the same time, I would say it's a it's shocking, but it's not surprising because the order that was in place before the 7th of October was such, was so violent. And this is something that human rights, human rights community in, in Palestine, including in Israel and abroad, has said it through and through. Violence generate violence. How much can you oppress the people before waiting for a reaction? Um, but I would like to go back to something you said in the beginning, um, Frank. You said, in a way, Palestine today is like a symbol. For me, Palestine has become more and more a metaphor um, to to describe the world in which we live in. And this is just another way to interpret what Susan just said in terms of relationship between uh, the the, the 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 most vulnerable and the most powerful, uh, the richer and the poorer, or those who have been made, those who have been forced to stay poor, because the Palestinian people are not poor, never been poor. They have been pushed back in a, to an extent to, to the Middle Age. This is the feeling I was having crossing South Hebron Hills when I was in Palestine or certain areas of Gaza. The level of de-development that had been imposed, inflicted upon the Palestinians before this, was already telling of, of that dynamic between rich and poor. But this is also, um, now it, the, the, there is this relationship is one of, of extreme, <clears throat> also representing the, the relations between the, the global north and the global south, the west and the rest, and the, the law, international law, without... Uh, being too naive about the power of the law to solve these issues, but it's a stake because <clears throat> for the first time, uh, Israel is not just pursuing someone, something, something through illegal means, which has always been the case. Israel has violating international law for decades uh, through and through. But now also it overtly admits the goals. It overtly talks about erasing Gaza, flattening Gaza, forcibly displaced 2 million people, admitting that 
causing death by bombs, starvation, or disease is something is the price to pay for Israel to live in peace and security. This is the monstrosity of the century. And I agree with Susan, letting it thrive, letting it go unpunished, not only, not only it exposes the brutality of the world we live in, it plummets the value of all the system we have in place to protect all of us. It will trash forever. Whatever has been there are guarantees to protect human beings because it eventually uh, crystallizes this uh, conception of rights, not as universal, but rights for, for a few people. This is not rights. These are privileges. And again, it's, it's something that we have the chance to resolve. This is a... A global battle at this point, a global struggle for justice and for peace and for survival, both of the Palestinians and Israelis. It's not just because it's the, it, in, a, in a way, I do see also the end of Israel as a system of values, whatever, whatever it was before, but it cannot continue as a so sustained by a genocidal call as, uh, as it is. It's a very, there is a profound disease in that society today, and it's evident. Thanks, Francesca. Um, uh, Francesca, you, you spoke a lot about international law, um, accountability, justice. And um, I had um, I had a chat with Daniel Makova, he's a lawyer in, in the UK um, a few days ago, who said that even more so for people that work in international law, so jurists, lawyers, it's the case that was launched by South Africa against Israel at the ICJ is crucial because if if people stop believing in justice and a lot of people have stopped believing in justice and actually not in justice but in the justice system yes what do we have left you know we've spoke about the poor the rich you know in israel we know mm -hmm. there's an apartheid system that divides you know rights depending or of your on your racial ethnicity but if international law is applied only for dictators, for example, in the in the poorest country in Africa, but are never is never applied for, you know, war crimes criminals uh, from the West. Uh, what does he say about the world we live in? I, I want to briefly, because I think the uh, eighty-two, I think, or eighty-three pages uh, document that South Africa sent to the ICJ is an incredible tool that we can use as activists because it, it says everything. He also puts everything into context. He talks about the Nakba, he talks about apartheid, he talks about, he talks about ethnic cleansing. But when I spoke to Daniel, he was like, Frank, you need to read this document because even if you followed everything since October 7th, the facts are so shocking. The in genocidal statements are so shocking that you will be shocked. Uh, I'll just quote a few things, you know, per paragraph 18 under the facts, it says that Gaza, who's home, uh, which is home to approximately 2.3 million people, almost half of them children, has been subjected to by Israel to what has been described as one of the heaviest conventional bombing campaigns in yeah. the history of modern warfare. Um, then um, there is I mean, there's so much, you know, it says, um, again, at the time of writing in December 28th, 21,000 Palestinians have been killed, 7,000 children, 55 Palestinians have been injured, uh, 1,000 amputees disabled for life, uh, one children dying every 15 minutes. I mean, sometimes, you know, I, I remember Rifat uh, Alarir, part of this organization, um, or charity called We Are Not Numbers, you know, that people in Gaza were saying, we are not numbers. Um, but in fact, sometimes the numbers are so shocking that it's important <clears throat> to actually mention them because it, it shows the level of monstrosity that it's happening in Gaza. So maybe I wanted to ask you, Francesca, about this case at the ICJ um, as, a, as an international law specialist yourself. Do you believe in it? What do you think it could achieve? Uh, we could have a, an answer from the ICJ very quickly, 
by mid month or the end of the month, the ICJ could come out with a, a ruling on the first part, which is Israel has to stop its genocide. So what do you make of it? And do you think it's a, it's a crucial moment in the search for justice in, in Palestine? Uh, there are probably three points I'd like to make. And by the way, that uh, interview of yours uh, with Daniel McCover was great. It was very telling. Uh, <clears throat> and I will try not to repeat anything Daniel said. It was, it was brilliant. But um, as, he, as he mentioned, it's very important that a state like South Africa uh, brought the case to the ICJ for the preventive, uh, for the for the measures that need to be declared in order to stop what's going on. Again, they, they presented hundreds of statements, genocidal statements that declare, my might not declare, uh, but in the, in this case they do genocidal intent, and they are matched with the practice, and they are matched with the capacity of Israel to perpetrate, gen to commit genocide. So the, I, I do expect that the court will uh, will uh, declare some preventive um, preventative measures like, as, at a minimum, at a minimum, and I hope it's just a minimum, a ceasefire. I also think that there should be the deployment of a protective force um, declaring the immediate and unconditional withdrawal of Israeli troops from the occupied Palestinian territory. There is no way that it, con it can continue uh, uh, as it is. For me, this is the minimum. But then, of course, there are so many other things that need to be fixed because it's this... <clears throat> Again, I also hope the court will have a chance to look at how uh, unlawfully the concept of self-defense has been used by, by Israel, because there is also reference to this in the South African submission. Um, what I, there is a, a non-obvious element that comes through, and it goes to that what you said, people still believe in justice. Surely the Palestinians do, because I keep on saying there has been peaceful resistance, including trying to use international law, international mechanism, international avenues, and everything has been frustrated. Everything has been politicized and uh, and manipulated to, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a physical principle. The moment you, um, you frustrate peaceful resistance, it's not that you will annihilate the resistance. You will take the, 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 the reason for resistance to be peaceful away, and you will give no other opportunity to turn resistance into something aggressive. Now, the reason why the use of force is regulated under international law is to make sure that it's not brutal, it's not fierce, it's not wild. But this is exactly what the international order dominated by uh, primarily the US, but also the, the rest of the West, and Israel is leading us to. Uh, so it's this is why I think it's a momentous uh, phase in history where we have the opportunity to make things right. And this would be really to honor also the sacrifice of the so many who have lost their life. But again, um, it's difficult to envisage justice at the end of this, because it's so ugly, it's so murky, and there are so many who will stay traumatized for generations. I think all those who have been orphaned, those who all those who have been mutilated in the body and the soul by this assault, senseless assault. It, it's difficult to stay positive in uh, in this particular moment. Probably the last point I would like to make, it's this is a critical turning point for international lawyers as well. Because, you know, outside of the legal discipline, there are many, including Israeli scholars, uh, who, have who have spoken of genocide, incremental genocide, for a long time, Raz Sigal and Ilan Pape, among, the, 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 among the, the Israelis. Then there are, of course, many others, and the Palestinians. They've said there are eliminatory elements in the policies and practices that Israel put in place. But now it's interesting to see how many international lawyers are defending are defending what Israel is doing, are justifying, saying, oh, yeah, but these are crimes, war crimes and crimes against humanity, as if it was better. No, everything needs to be linked together and connected to that intent, which is so overtly proclaimed. Because, again, uh, with other special rapporteurs, we have said what, already a couple of months ago, it looks like a genocide committed through modern 
means of warfare and 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 an unprecedented brutality as far as I'm concerned. Susan, um, Francesca spoke about uh, justice, uh, accountability. Uh, you live yourself in the United States of America, who is the main block and has been the main obstacle to justice, accountability, and, and peace in the region for, for decades. Um, it was important for me to have you both on, in a way, because uh, Francesca is a you know international law specialist and, and jurist, um, and you are you are an author. And um, I was wondering, um, what do you make of it? Do, do you believe in justice as a Palestinian? And what do you, what does it? What do you say about the country you are living in? And we spoke about this previously, about the dehumanization of the Palestinian people. And we've heard recently, what's the guy, the PR person of the, the spokesperson of the United States of America, the press guy, who said, um, he repeated Israel's propaganda, you know, South Africa claim at the ICJ is blood libel. So, yeah. and sorry, because I've got a, a follow-up question. At one point, when let's say there's one country in the world that blocks everything and that permits a genocide to continue. And actually, I'm not saying one country, I'm saying one government, one person, Biden and his administration. <clears throat> At one point, we as a people say, Halas, enough. Why should we? Because you're saying, let's have the genocide continue. Say, what can we do? They say we can continue. At one point, should we think of other ways to, to mm -hmm. actually, you know, to, for real direct democracy in a way to, to actually exist. Sorry, that was a bit of a rambling question, but <laughs> I hope you got it. So I, I think we, we should be realistic about the, um, the reach of international law. I mean, there was the ICJ um, decision uh, decades ago regarding the wall um, and there will probably be a positive decision uh, resulting from South Africa's petition. But the reality is that it will have no teeth and um, it will not change the reality uh, because what's clear, what has been clear to all of us for a long time is that international law has been in practice, uh, serving the interests of the West. It has been okay. serving the interests of the powerful. Much like, much like domestic law here. You know, it's, it's, set up, it's, uh, it's set up to criminalize poor people, Black people, brown people. And the people who commit the real crimes uh, are usually rich white men who who do what they want and there's never consequence. And this is, uh, this is also, this happens on the global level. That is what international law has, uh, has meant for us. I personally don't have a whole lot of faith in it. Um, I recognize that it is, you know, it is a tool. It is a strategy. Um, and and it's also quite beautiful that South Africa took this initiative because it is a um, it, it, it's it's a moment of of solidarity that that is hugely important for any revolution for any resistance movement. I believe, and I think at this hour, the majority of Palestinians believe that armed resistance is uh is the is the only effective means we have and that historically uh has been true i mean if you look at every moment um in our history where palestinians were able to effectively push back against this sort of incremental genocide that has been happening you know, it's kind of, you know, I've said this before, imperialism by the inch, one home at a time, one family at a time. And, uh, it, but historically, 
you know, when after the Nakba, Palestinians went from one country to another, they tried from one court to another, they pleaded, uh, and, and nothing happened. Nothing, you know, we were still in refugee camps, we still languished, Israel continued to uh, to do whatever it wants. And the only time the world even began to recognize and 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 say our name and uh and affirm that we exist is when we started hijacking planes um in the 70s in the 60s and 70s and you know and then again the only time the world paid us any attention was after the first intifada and then the second intifada Every moment of, of, you know, peaceful resistance. And as a matter of fact, I mean, Palestinians just existing in their homes, existing in their lives, continuing to build cultural institutions and universities, which Israel bombs with this just uh, this grotesque jealousy that we should not have anything, that we should just be uh, these ignorant, um, uh, uh, you know, unsophisticated labor, cheap labor pool for them. Um, this has happened, you know, every, every, every few years they do this. They come in and they, they, they destroy these institutions. They steal our records. They steal our books, uh, our documents, or they bomb it all. And so, I mean, my point is that the only thing that has offered us any gains has been has been armed resistance um the you know the 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 constant passive resistance of just existing and not leaving our homeland has been a form there have been uh, moments of appealing to international law as you know there's pending cases there have been um moments to to try and uh for other other countries to try and hold uh, Israeli war criminals accountable, um, uh, none of that none of that pans out. And of course, the Great March of Return, as you know, Palestinians simply just uh, um, demonstrating at the separation fence, and uh, and then just being picked off for sport. You know, just shot and and murdered and maimed. I mean, we have generations of every generation has a whole uh, maimed community of amputees and uh, um, you know with eyes shot out or and and whatnot. It it's just it hasn't it has been unrelenting for decades, and every time every time Israel gets away with mass slaughter, the next time they escalate, they escalate. So. Um, as I've said before, and as Francesca just said, it is shocking, but it's not surprising. I mean, we keep using that word shocking, shocking, and it, and it is. It just, it, it's, it jolts the conscience, and it's hard to contend with. It's hard to, to exist in this country, um, in particular, where everybody not only just goes about their business as if, you know, this genocide isn't happening with uh, with our public dollars, but you know, you you see people with these signs and their lawns. I support Israel. You see, you hear these uh, comments from congressmen and women and senators and uh, high level politicians, um, really just being okay with what we're all seeing. So because of that, I don't, I don't think we can realistically rely on international law, certainly not in the short term. Um, I think there is a lot of work. I don't think it's a lost cause, though. I think there's a lot of work there for, for the legal community to continue to struggle in that arena, uh, to hold, to hold uh, war criminals accountable. But I think we have to find ways for mass mobilization. For example, I'm of the opinion that 
we we need to urgently convene an international conference of uh, of intellectuals of youth movements. Um, I think it needs to happen. I I don't know how to make it happen. I don't have the connections or the money or those sources. But I want to say this to put it out there for for anyone who might be listening. We do need to uh, have such a conference urgently with major players around the world and interested parties to come up with a with a with a strategy that can be adopted by people because it's clear that we cannot expect anything on the level of uh, those in power, whether it's Arab leaders or or Western leaders. Um, some of the things that should be on such an agenda are, for one thing, there are, there are things that have been working um, through through the through sheer through the sheer force of grassroots uh, efforts like the boycott. Um, I mean, we see corporations like Starbucks and McDonald's really reeling, and and I think. I think this can be expanded and intensified and it will have an effort. So that's one thing. Another thing is, you know, what has um, uh, social media has emerged as a profoundly powerful force in in all of this. Um, primarily because it is shaping uh, public opinion. Um, in ways that um, shouldn't be controlled, but they are. So, and all of these corporations are uh, based in the U.S., and they are led by people with who who are either outright Zionists or who um, who have you know Zionist sympathies. And as we know, I mean, Frank, I know you just got banned from Instagram. I've been banned from Twitter. Um, so many people across the board who who uh, who provide information and content to the rest of the world are getting shadow banned and and deplatformed in one way or another. So I think another agenda item is to is to really develop and come up with a strategy to have a well funded, uh, well thought out. Um, startup project to to replace uh or, or to incentivize people to migrate away from these uh from the from the current social media giants that are uh very clearly um aiding and abetting this genocide and it, it i think this is a really important thing to do uh also, not just because of the political situation, but also for the health of society. I mean, these um, these corporations are, are 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 predators. They prey on children, uh, and they they are altering the minds of young people in in ways that are profoundly harmful. There's a lot of data on that, and I think I think coming up with such a such a platform um, that could be created in in collaboration with childhood development experts and the like that would incentivize people to to the parents to to have their children on those platforms and that and and, and that would truly be a, a space for free expression um i think that's really important and i i don't and at the same time i think we should challenge the current the, the current uh um, mega corporations for social media because they also have to be held to account but i just you know i am of the belief in that you know if something is is terrible um rather than just fighting it and and empowering it with your energy and your fight just create an alternative that that can replace it and i think that's i think that's something that's really important to do and i um and I think there are others in the world who have great ideas and uh, creative, uh, creative impulses that that could help really truly move 
global society towards this ideal that we all want and and it has to start with uh with all of us gathering in one in one space um francesca i don't know if you have ideas of how to make something like that happen or if you even think it's um it's it would be valuable but um yeah i i uh, we have to we have to develop solutions um beyond continuing try to try to appeal to corrupt leaders thanks oh you, you go frank may i don't may i chime in yeah, yeah of course yeah no, no i wanted to give you the the floor yeah no there it, i mean i i i share uh much of what susan said because i mean I, i'm i'm scared as well of how social media on the one hand it has such a huge potential because it is the place where some uh, more factual, more truthful narrative has spread. And still navigating the censorship and resorting to way other to talk about Palestine that was not so like uh, um, obscured by this the, the giants that that um, own the social the social most of the social media platforms but I, I do remember that twitter for example was born as such as an alternative place for intellectual political exchange other than facebook and then it was it became so big that it was difficult to protect it from the rapacious sort of uh, um, will to control and this is what it's happening today still still this is where most of the information of I mean, the Palestinians have, from Gaza have been their own storytellers. And no matter the obstructions, no matter the censorship from those who own the social media platforms and others, because I agree with Susan, it would be ideally much better to have something not controlled. But it, in the meantime, we need to use and try to democratize what, what we have. So I don't think that it's mutually exclusive. And, and and it's incredible how the Palestinians, this is why I had a question at the beginning for Susan, why the Palestinians, unlike many other people from the global south, managed to make themselves visible. They resist, they resist through their very existence. Unlike many, I mean, these, 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 these are, they are not the only ones whose right of self-determination has been, been violated, hijacked. And at the same time, they are there, resisting with their history, their culture, their demands for justice and, and rights. And I wanted to, to ask Susan if, and then we can go back to the ideas for, I mean, how to be creative. Let's remember that that South, the South Africa apartheid was uh, undone, not because of the decision of, of the most powerful states, which have been supporting South, South, South Africa through and through. But it started with the will or lack of will to support or to, to partake in the apartheid system of workers in Ireland and the UK and so on and so forth. So we need to go through there. But something, a question I had for Susan, as she's one who took that that request, that message by Edward Said of we we need to become our own storytellers. We need to tell more. And I, I mean, I read this in uh, that wondrous book of yours, uh, Susan, um, Mornings in Jenin. How has the capacity of the Palestinians to, to tell their story changed over time? And what, what is this capacity today? How we, from the outside, can sustain more that capacity? Because this is what I feel extremely frustrating, for example, in being in a country like Italy. Because again, I keep on saying it shouldn't be about me. Okay, I have a mandate. I have a UN special rapporteur uh, mandate, but I am an accessory in this story. It still it should be the Palestinians and the Israelis who stand with the Palestinians for their quest for justice and 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 rights and dignity to be heard first and foremost. Uh, it's very difficult to see it happening, and I wanted to to hear how Susan sees that. And sorry, Frank, we I don't want you to feel put in the no. margin of of this. It's but fine. I'm not that old yet, but I'm a, and I'm not rich, but I'm 
a white man. So I'm, I'm more than happy to disappear. <laughs> no, no. So, um, you know, like all colonizers, the Zionists came to, to Palestine from Europe. They brought these European um, ideas of supremacy with them. And they, of course, they, they underestimate um, our humanity, our attachment to the land, our, uh, our sophistication, um, even, in, even in, in the agricultural rural areas. There's a deep connection to the land. There's a deep tradition of stories. I mean, all the names of the towns throughout Palestine that you see, they are born of stories. They're born of, um, uh, of, 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 of you know, ideas about the land formations and folk tales. And, um, and this is all part of, uh, it's part of our DNA in, in some ways. And when the land was quite literally pulled out from under our feet, there, this, these ethos of education and continuing to build where it became, became premium, became paramount to us. And, um, and I, I kind of, the characters in, the, in Mornings and Janine sort of intimated that to some extent, um, that, you know, everything can be taken away, but they cannot take away your ideas or your education. And, and this was an idea that, um, suffused through the refugee camps and through those who remained. So Palestine, even under occupation, Palestine, even after Israel, I mean, Israel was uh, intentional in uh, confiscating Palestinian books, Palestinian documents, Palestinian records. Many of them are still in their um, in Israeli libraries that are sort of under uh, a kind of seal you have to have special permission to to view those books and um and it was kind of this effort to ignorize us but palestinians persevered we built universities we built cultural centers even under occupation even under extraordinarily difficult circumstances and the same thing happened in gaza when israel decided to put uh, uh to to establish the siege on gaza um, if you if you look back to the rhetoric of the time, they talked about uh, the, you know the siege sending Gaza back to the Stone Ages. They wanted and expected to have these um, utterly destitute, begging you know people living in horrific conditions that would be subdued by poverty, subdued by, by, by the cruelty of the siege. But Palestinians found a way. And, you know, they, they dug those tunnels with Egypt initially to bring in goods. Uh, then those were bombed and flooded. They, um, they, they, uh, they became really good at, um, uh, freelance work, um, remote work, not freelance, but remote, you know, that there's this massive sort of computer and um, digital work that that proliferated in Gaza. They, their engineers um, came up with ways to re, to uh, to use the rubble of their bombed homes and recycle it. I mean, they they continue to find ways to live and to thrive even under, you know, I mean, if you look at Gaza, um, even under the siege, they built cafes and they built it's it, the bottom line is that it's a high functioning society. And, and they were not content to uh, to live without aspirations. They were not content to live without um, without. Access to what everybody else has in the world, and they continued to. Uh, uh, they just would not accept that they were lesser humans, that they were children of a lesser God of, in some ways. And I think this was this is and has been galling for Israel, and which is why every time they would bomb Gaza, they always targeted um, places that uh, of enrichment. So like, you know, I think in, in, in 
2020 or 2021, they bombed um, this wonderful cultural center where I had given book readings and, and I know a lot of, a lot of young people uh, uh, just valued it so much because it was a place for artists and a place for writers. And uh, so they, they target those places and, and in this latest sort of insane campaign, they just, they're just doing everything they wanted to do, which is to just destroy the infrastructure of life, to leave nothing, nothing, uh, it, it, to create a situation in which the most anybody can hope for is to get a glass of clean water every day. That is what they have done, and it's intentional. Um to your question about how how we've managed to be visible, um, I think there are a lot of factors that play into that. I mean, one of them is what I just what I just talked about is this sort of um, continuing to be a high functioning society, um, both as individuals and as a collective, despite um, despite extraordinary forces that are. Uh, dismantling you, and the other the other aspect is that this region and this land in particular is so deeply seeped in uh, in the psyches of people around the world, um, people of faith, people people who are students of history. Um, so much was born from this small patch of land. That, that has echoed through civilizations all over the world. Uh, and so it is, a, it is a focal point. And the third thing is that unlike every other conflict, every other atrocity in the world that is uh, uh, correctly identified as atrocities, correctly identified as um, uh, a genocide or whatever it may be, the situation in Palestine is still one of, uh, of, of mythology and fantasy that, that pervades uh, popular imagination. So um, it is still the only place in the world where the, the greatest powers in the world will look at and say, well, this entity, this colonial entity that is immensely powerful has a right to defend itself from a defenseless civilian indigenous population. There is no other place in the world where that is happening. Uh, there's no other place in the world where um, atrocities on this level are committed chronically over decades, where, where uh, uh, the powers and the shapers and the movers in the world um, support it and refuse to use the correct language um, to to identify it. And so, and I think I think the masses in the world, even if they don't know the history, even if they don't know the facts or the details, especially those masses in the global south and um and and oppressed communities here in, in the United States have a sort of visceral knowledge have a visceral understanding of what they see with their lying eyes you know that like wait this looks so much like what we went through this looks but but then they're hearing something different in the narrative and so um so yeah, so it is it it, it is a focal point. It, it is the linchpin between, as I said earlier, between this uh, uh, dominant Western oppressive hegemony and the and the and the aspirations of the oppressed. So this is it. This is the this is the button, and I think um, uh, it, it is a combination of you know, the tenacity of Palestinians, but also uh, the sort of the, 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 what people around the world understand um, viscerally or, or intellectually as well um, about this region. Does that make sense? Thanks, I don't know if I... Susie. Yeah, I mean, it does. 
to me anyway. Um, I wanted to say that we're going to have to wrap up soon um, because um, that's how it works. <laughs> but uh, but also, I mean, we know and uh, that we could go on and on and on uh, for hours. And that's what we were, we've been talking about, you know, finding a space where we can talk, we can organize, we can do workshops. And you mentioned, Suzanne, some kind of a conference, international conference. And, uh, and, um, and I have been thinking of something like this with others for, for a few weeks now. Um, and uh, we can talk um, about it, you know, further. Um, uh, and I think it will happen this year, because that's 2024 now. And I think we can uh, go back to this conversation the three of us around um, a coffee and without computers and and wires all around us. Um, I mean, we can talk for another like five, 10 minutes, but I, I, what you said, Susan, was very, um, you know, all colonial powers and even more so actually, you know, settler colonial societies, because they want to make you believe that the other doesn't exist. The first thing they go for, historically, it's been proven right is culture if you want to erase the people you erase the books you erase the paintings you erase the songs you erase the food and i remember of a film made in 2012 called the great book robbery which was about how israel in 1948 looted more than 70,000 books out of you know palestinian libraries and stuff and uh, my very good friend uh, hada karmi was was uh, in the documentary because her family was um had her books and her art stolen from from Israel. And uh, I also wanted to go back to one point you made. I remember when I was in Nablus in the West Bank in uh, 2008, I think, um, my very good friend, Saeed Abu Hijle, um, was taking me around Nablus and talking to me about the resistance. And we went to the cemetery and, uh, and a young guy who was with us, um, a French guy, more like, you know, UN type said like, but why you guys, Palestinians, don't do like massive peaceful demonstrations? You know, you take the street and you walk for hours and you chant. And, and Saad said, we have tried. But when you do a demonstration and you see your friends, one after the other, getting shot in the head, in the stomach, in the legs by snipers, after a few months, you stop. And then he spoke about you know, armed resistance as well. At one point, you know, what do we do? You know, and actually, you know, Saad, and I hope he's watching, I haven't seen him for years. He's, I love this man. Sha Saad's mother, Shaden, was shot by an Israeli sniper right outside her house. She was sitting on the porch, knitting or something, and she was shot, shot dead in, uh, I can't remember the date now, I made a short film about it. So it's to show that this talk about, if only the Palestinian Mandela existed, if only this, if only that. And people, by the way, forget that Mandela formed the armed wing of the ANC. <laughs> you know, it's easy to forget for mainstream media. But that it's, it's true, this collective history that in a way we can learn and, and, and move. And I think the Palestinians are our teachers in a way, right? Because of the fact that they remain on the land and uh, and... My opinion, maybe, is that's what's driving Israel more and more crazy. You know, whatever, whatever the fuck we'd be doing, the Nakba ethnic cleansing, killing them, destroying their houses, they're still here. So they, you know, it's like a monster that doesn't know what to do anymore. So they go and drop like dumb bombs on them. But at one point, there's nothing else you can do. They are still on the land. And, uh, and that's, our, that's our hope. And in a way, I think that's, for me anyway, European, whatever, you know, that's my duty to actually do something about it. Anyway, me rambling again. We're going to have to wrap up, but if you want to have the last words, because the old crumble, the old world crumbles, so you should speak, you know, we should be led by women. Uh, it sounds like maybe pat patronizing, but I truly believe that we would be in a much better place if the world was led by women. But anyway, um, yeah, feel free if you want to wrap up. You know, Francesca, you muted. <laughs> you mute, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. No, I was saying, yeah, I 
I agree. At least, at least let us try. <laughs> but over to you, over to you, Susan. I would have a comment on only on the media and the horrible, horrible, horrible work they're doing. They have always done on Palestine because there is a, uh, and it, it, we need to denounce the anti-Palestinian racism. And we are always focus on anti-Semitism, which is real. I mean, anti-Semitism in Europe still exists. No question about that. But there is another phenomenon which is completely underreported and misunderstood, not understood, which is the anti-Palestinian racism. And we Europeans should detect it because the level of dehumanization that we have inflicted on, on Jewish people for centuries, it's very similar with the way we cannot recognize the humanity in the other, in the Palestinians today. Um, and, uh, and, and the media are amplifying this kind of racism by not understanding or not representing the truth, the facts, and yeah, not reporting the numbers, but even when they report the numbers, the stories, the humanity behind behind these figures gets lost. So this would be my only my only closing points. We all need to do a good job also to hold um like sources of information, media, traditional media, and social media accountable. Suzanne, we, I'll, I'll let you have the closing remarks. Um, I, uh, for, for sure, Francesca, and I think that um, the use of anti-Semitism has been a, a quite an effective weapon to, to silence um, all of us. I mean, I know it's been used against you as well, and um, and I uh, I want to also uh, thank you, Francesca. Uh, you have been a real champion, and I you know I've seen you, uh, I've seen your interviews, and I've seen the passion which you exhibit here. Um, and you know we have to have you as a friend, you know, uh, of Palestine, and and so many like you, um, keeping keeping this issue alive and refusing to allow it to fade into uh, oblivion as Israel would like it to do um, is, uh, is hugely appreciated. Um, so that's what we can end it with that. And I, I also want to, I, I do want to also, um, as a Palestinian, I want to salute the resistance. Um, I, I really tire of, uh, of, of, so many condemning them. Uh, it is um, it's it's hugely unfair. Uh, I you know when um, when there were slave rebellions in this country, they were brutal. When there were indigenous American rebellions in this country, they were also brutal. But we all knew and we all know who the victims are. And it's no different here. The, the armed resistance in Gaza now are essentially an army of orphans. Those children that we see today shaking uncontrollably, utterly traumatized and 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 broken and uh, and terrified, those children are exactly what these fighters were in previous conflicts. And I think everybody needs to understand that. Um, and I, I personally, I salute them. I will not condemn them. And I, I, I want to make that very clear. And, um, and I, I, I hope they win. I hope they continue to fight. I hope others will join them. And uh, because this seems to be the only thing that, uh, uh, that moves Israel at all. Um, it is clearly a pathological society that, um, that sees unspeakable and unfathomable pain and uh, not only cheers it, but uh, but ask for more and more, uh, and 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 I think I think that's deeply pathological. I it, to the point where I almost feel sorry for them, 
I cannot imagine being that kind of a human being who's utterly devoid of a conscience. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you both. Um, this was um, amazing. And, um, and I think, um, you know, this helps, you know, this helps us grow. Talking is, is, is crucial um, and sharing experiences and stories. And so uh, um, thank you, you know, grazie mille, shukran um, And uh, so, yeah, this was uh, Witnessing Palestine. Uh, this is the episode two. Um, and um, yeah, there'll be others to come. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.